Bankless Nation. We are live here with Senator Toomey. Senator Toomey is a senator, Republican senator from uh, Pennsylvania. He's also a ranking member of the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs a Committee. This is a very important uh, committee. He's also in the past been somewhat friendly to crypto and some of the things we've been up to. Senator, welcome to Bankless. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me. Can we start with the big picture? We want to cover a few things today. Um, we want to talk about FTX and some other things, but sure. can you give us the big picture of the upside, the potential that you see in crypto? Why have you defended it before and how do you think it might help the American people? Well, so here's the way I think about this. Um, when the internet first came, came along and we could exchange emails, that was great. And at that point, it never for a second occurred to me that someday, like all consumer products would be happening uh, over the internet, that I'd be able to use an iPhone to hail a car. Uh, I mean, the, the list is endless. It was so transformative of our entire economy. So now I look at, at what crypto means to me, and I think of different crypto projects as like these various protocols. Uh, and, and a lot of them are like, like operating systems on which people can run these apps that are going to do all kinds of things that probably exceed my imagination as much as everything we take for granted today exceeded my imagination back in 1999 when I first started doing emails. So I don't know all the way. I mean, there's the obvious categories like like payments and identity verification and ownership issues and things like that. Those, those are already pretty clear, but I, I think the potential of this sort of freestanding, independent, uh, disintermediated uh, software is enormous. And I, I'm not necessarily sold on the value of any particular token, but I, I don't think it's really about the value of individual tokens. I think it's about the underlying technology. So your argument is this is an important underlying technology, uh, like the internet, it's innovative right. in that capacity. Can we frame the, the question another way and ask it the opposite way, which is like, what's at stake if the US misses crypto? Let's say, I mean, the US is very supportive from a regulatory and legislative perspective of the internet in the 1990s. Right. Um, what's at stake if we don't take a similar approach to crypto now? Well, an amazing, maybe completely transformative wave of technology happens somewhere else. And someone else, and I don't know where that is, it, it, maybe it's dispersed, maybe it's concentrated probably happens in a context that's not entirely consistent with things that we value very much, like the rule of law and intellectual property and privacy. Um, and who knows uh, the, the kind of jobs and the economic growth that we would be foregoing, um, and frankly, probably even national security issues. So, so I think it would be unbelievably misguided for us not to create an environment where Americans can drive this technology. Is Capitol Hill talking about um, maybe um, what China is doing in the blockchain space? And they're, 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 just like there are different kind of, kinds of the internet, there's the open internet, and then there's sort of a, a more closed internet behind right. firewalls. Um, China is very active in what it, what it called like the blockchain space, but it has its own sure. centralized, um, right technology that's kind of replacing it. Is there any talk in Capitol Hill of like what some of uh, America's competitors are doing, uh, you know, and you keeping up with them or like, are we even talking about that right now? Yeah, there's some discussion about that. And one of the ways that comes up a lot is a discussion about a central bank digital currency. As you know, the Chinese have already deployed one to a pretty significant extent. And look, I think their motivation is pretty bad. I think a lot of their motivation is the dramatic extent to which it enhances their ability to surveil their, their population. And they would love to see adoption uh, everywhere it's possible because then they could surveil everyone else too. Um, I, don't, I don't like the idea of authoritarian regimes having those powers. By the way, 
I don't want the U.S. Federal Reserve to have those powers either. Hmm. But, but, but to your question, yes, it's come up. And one of, the, one of the questions that people have wrestled with is if the Chinese are using a technology that allows their currency to be used in ways that a dollar can't, does it give them an advantage and give them an opportunity to erode the presence of the U.S. dollar as the leading reserve currency in the world? My own view is there are other reasons why the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And it's hard for the Chinese to displace us, especially given their closed and authoritarian society. But why wouldn't we want to have the most technologically sophisticated currency in the world? By the way, that doesn't mean a central bank digital dollar. I think stable coins issued by private issuers can play that role. Uh, but I want the dollar to, it's a huge advantage to uh, Americans for the dollar to be uh, the leading reserve currency and having stable coins proliferating um, would enhance that. Senator Toomey, I know you're a big uh, proponent of some some stable coin regulation. I definitely want to get there uh, later in this conversation, especially uh, after we talk about some of the, uh, the, the role that the SEC has to play in how crypto is regulated. But of course, uh, we would, we would be remiss to talk about or not talk about the fallout of FTX. And I'd just like to take a peek into what the current state of Capitol Hill is uh, now that we are hearing this news about FTX. Uh, what is the gossip? What is the conversation yeah. that's happening with regulators on Capitol Hill about, about this news? Well, actually, you know, we had a hearing this morning where we were evaluating nominees, uh, mostly for the uh, governance of the FDIC, and this came up. And you could actually mm. get a real um, sort of uh, uh, condensed version of, of this discussion. I had some colleagues who have used the collapse of FTX as a way to paint the whole sector with this broad brush to damn everything. Uh, crypto is all a big uh, scam and Thank God you're doing everything you can to keep it out of our the real economy and so on, right? I've tried to make the argument that it's a profound and fundamental mistake to confuse bad action by a bad actor with the asset with which the bad action occurred, right? So what, what do we know about FDX? We know that they took customers' uh, assets and lent it to a related hedge fund, apparently, or you know, family office, whatever you want to call Alameda. Um, that's like wildly inappropriate to do that, <laughs> right? With with in, in any in, you, any kind of uh, financial service that does that, it's outrageous. But guess what? It's been happening in the fiat world forever. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's there's an endless list of financial institutions in the conventional, old-fashioned form who've done the exact same thing. And by the way, people who've gone to jail for having done so. So this is not a new offense and it is not at all specific to crypto. Like I've said, you know, the code committed no crime, um, but somebody looks like they probably did commit crimes. Um, we, the, the, it's crazy to blame it on crypto. You said that Senator, you said the code committed no crimes. Yes, I did. Are you awesome. alone in this this chant in Capitol Hill with the regulators? Or that, are, that particular are, one, the code committed no crime. I might be. <laughs> we might steal okay. that from you. What, <laughs> what about just like the broad concept of FTX and Sam Bankman Fried are not crypto, are not DeFi, and this was a centralized actor doing fraud? Like, are you the only person telling this story, no, or are I don't other think people? So I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I, look. So in the House, let, let me just be completely candid here. In, in the House. There are Democrats and Republicans who are very open to this new technology. You could say pro crypto, want to get to a thoughtful, sensible regulatory framework that's going to work. In the Senate, unfortunately, it's become a little bit polarized because the most outspoken Democrats have been extremely hostile to this whole space, while I and some of my Republican colleagues have been very open to this and, in fact, enthusiastic about. Uh, what is possible. Um, there are Democrats, let me be clear, there are Democrats in the Senate who are pro-crypto. Definitely. I, I work with some of them. We have legislation together. There is a very real 
likelihood even that we'll do bipartisan legislation soon. Hmm. But there's been a little bit of polarization. But no, I'm not alone in defending the proposition that um, what Sam Bankman Free did uh, cannot be blamed on crypto. Is there any way to convince your more skeptical colleagues, Senator Toomey, or what would it take to convince them? Or do you think some are just, they've made up their mind on this and nothing could happen? No facts, no arguments could convince them otherwise. So some are definitely in that category. They made up their mind, they don't want to hear the facts. So we're not going to win them over. But there's a lot who just don't know about this, just haven't had the time, taken the time, had the interest to do the work. And let's be honest, um, you know, it, it takes some work to understand how this goes, especially if you're, you know, an old geezer like me who's grown up with his whole life in the, in the fiat world. It, it takes some time and effort to understand the, the nature of this technology. It's two things that I think uh, are important ways to communicate with people who are still open-minded about it. One is get people to not necessarily focus on a particular token, like like what's a Dogecoin worth and, and well, how does it change when Elon Musk puts out a tweet? Or like, like that is like kind of ridiculous to focus on that and make that your understanding of this. But rather think about the technology. Think about a series of operating systems that are gonna make, um, make uh, processes and, and applications possible that could never be possible before. Oh, and by the way, make it possible without a central in intermediary taking a fee out. I mean, my friends on the left should be very enthusiastic about the possibility of, you know, bypassing the central intermediary, right? They, they, they take a lot of money out of transactions. It's their You're business. You're talking about model. the banks. You're talking about yeah, the, banks. the credit card processors. But everybody in the, look, the, how about the folks that like, validate title insurance. I mean, why the hell do we pay so much money for things like validating ownership? There's a much better way to do this. So the list goes on and on, right? And if what, what I think we haven't done a, a good enough job is explaining to people the practical real world applications that are in the works, some already up and running like, like file storage and things that are coming down the pike. And it's hard, right? To talk about what's possible in the future and what could be coming. But I think getting people to focus on that rather than, you know, the latest uh, collapse of, you know, Terra and Luna um, would, would help a long way, go a long way. Well, it's certainly rare to be able to see through the forest for the trees in, in the crypto industry and, and understand the technology separate from the actual expression of what we see today. So, And it's even rarer that they, these people are, are regulators and are elected representatives. So, Pat, thank you so much for, for being able to see through the noise. It's difficult. This industry makes it very difficult to do that. Uh, I know that uh, there's a, a Senate hearing tomorrow uh, about the FTX collapse from the Senate Ag Committee. Uh, are you privy to what might be discussed there? Like, what can we expect to come out of that hearing tomorrow? Do you have any insight there? Uh, so I'm not on the committee. And mm -hmm. so I really don't know, you know, exactly what's going to happen. I don't know how this play. I'm, I'm not even sure who all they've invited to testify, but I hope it represents people who can make a persuasive case to look at this for what it is. A very bad actor that did some very bad things and we need to get to the bottom of it. Uh, and, and let's, by all means, look into that. And uh, I, I think the Department of Justice is looking into that as well as they should. Um, but I hope that gets separated from the underlying technology. I think there's a myth in, you know, people put forward about crypto, like people in crypto don't want uh, regulation or they don't want yeah. legislation. Uh -huh. And, and yeah. the reaction to that is like, no, like we want reasonable, um, good regulation and legislation that protects a kind of values that this country was founded on and doesn't stifle innovation. Is that too much to ask? I want to ask, um, you know, people listening to this podcast might not be as familiar with how laws are kind of created and how the different uh, committees work together, right? There is uh, the DCCPA that was uh, talked about recently, which is some legislation, I believe, coming out of the Ag Committee. Is is anything going to happen with that? Do we, do we know anything about that? And like, how do the different various committees um, talk about crypto legislation. Like, wh what are you seeing from from your perspective on the legislative front? Well, uh, uh, there's a lot to try to unpack there. Um, 
part of part of the challenge is that the Senate's not functioning the way the Senate should be functioning, the way the Senate actually functioned when I first got to the Senate, which is not like a different century or anything. Um, <laughs> uh, so the committee process isn't working well, right? The way it should work is if there's committees that have overlapping or tangential or related jurisdiction, they should each produce the relevant legislation. And then you work out the differences. You put that on the Senate floor. You have a big debate. You have amendments and something passes. And meanwhile, the House should be doing the same thing. Now you've got two different products and you have a conference where you iron out the differences and you end up with a single product that is the consensus that you can achieve through the conference. And then you take that product back to both chambers for an up or down vote. That's the way, that's the textbook way that it's supposed to work. That is the way that it used to work, including when I first got to the Senate, but it's not working that way now. So unfortunately we've devolved to a situation where what happens is, um, so you could take my legislation to fix the broker definition in, in that came out of the infrastructure bill from a year and a half ago, or you could take my stable coin bill. I look to find a Democrat counterpart who is going to be a champion on their side. I act as the champion on my side. We try to get broad buy-in and then we get the key players who are the gatekeepers for extraneous legislation going into a must pass bill of which we have three or four typically every year. And there's a, this is a, this is a very opaque process, which is part of what's so bad about it, but that's, that's what we're left with at this point. And, and frankly, I'm going to use that process to the maximum extent I can for some of my crypto priorities. And the year's not over yet. We still have a shot at getting some of them done this way. But it shouldn't work this way, but that's where we are at the moment. One of the big reasons why this FTX disaster got so big was because a lot of the lack of clarity that's on the inside of the United States for right. our own regulated in, uh, crypto institutions like Gemini and Coinbase, they just haven't been able to produce some of the products that were so attractive that FTX was Correct. able to produce because they were in the Bahamas. And a lot of the ire out of people in the crypto space has been directed towards Gary Gensler and his uh, hard handedness towards American companies and his also neglect of external companies like FTX. Uh, is there, what, what's the, is there any, do you share in that frustration of Gary Gensler and the SEC or what's the role, what, what's the opinion of, yeah. of that, the of Gensler's administration by uh, your fellow regulators? Well, let me just tell you, I have been arguing with Gary Gensler publicly and privately for two years now, since he took this job and the central argument that I make, my, my central problem is to say, Mr. Chairman, you have repeatedly stated that virtually every token is a security. I don't happen to agree with that, but given your assertion, you owe it to us to lay out publicly a very clear way in which people who want to comply with the law and regulation can do so. How does an issuer comply? What is the criteria? What is the rules? How do they do that? If you're operating an exchange, what does that mean? What do you have to do in order to be in compliance with SEC? The rules that we have for a stock exchange, for instance, don't all apply, right? I mean, custody and settlement and things like that, it's different in, in crypto. And, and my big criticism of Chairman Gensler is he has never laid out that clarity. He says, oh, come on in and talk to us and we'll talk to you. But that's no answer. Um, by the way, at, during those conversations, their enforcement lawyers are in the room taking down notes. And next thing you know, you get hit with an enforcement action. Uh, regulation by enforcement is a terrible, terrible approach. And the problem with this uncertainty that hangs over just about everyone who's developing a, a protocol is they don't know whether they're going to be, you know, there's going to be a knock at their door from the SEC about what they've done. And, and so the SEC has created the incentive for people to go offshore. This is, this is terrible. It's terrible because America loses the opportunity to have its leadership role in this space. It's terrible because when they go offshore, they're going to go to a place that has a very lax regulatory environment. Then 
customers are going to experience the kind of things that we've seen at FDX. So at all levels, this is a disaster. This, this is why we, Congress needs to step in, provide the guardrails, create the clarity, and let the regulators, which may or may not be the SEC, but let whoever we authorize through legislation um, objectively enforce the law and provide that certainty. It would be so helpful for this whole space. By, by the way, uh, I think everyone in crypto, maybe a lot of people listening to this, saw, saw your clip of you putting uh, Mr. Gensler on the hot seat and asking those questions of like, hey, what actually is a security? Like, can you yeah. define it? Um, well done. We appreciate you asking those questions because obviously we're not in the, the chambers and the halls where those questions can be asked. Um, I, I, I do also, like, I guess if you were to steel man a regulator's argument on this or Gary Gensler's argument, he, maybe he'd push back and point to Congress and say, hey, we don't have clarity. We don't have clarity. Uh, no, that's not his argument. Right. You, you, say it. Say it. Yeah. That would be understandable. You, 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 you could, a reasonable person could say that, could say, well, look, the securities law and the case law, right? Securities law to a large degree is court cases that have, have emerged over decades. The Howey test. The Howey test being one, right? Uh, these uh, are not well suited for this brand new technology. So rather than try to bang a square peg into a round hole, Congress, why don't you address some of these difficult issues? Like under what circumstances is a token actually a security and under what circumstances is it not, for instance? But they won't do that. That would be reasonable if Gary Gensler said that, but he doesn't say that. He says, everything's a security. It's all my territory. I own it. And by the way, I'm not gonna tell you, how you can comply with my rules until I show up and whack you with an enforcement action. That's what's so objectionable to me. Why? <laughs> why, why is it objectionable? No, why is he doing this? <laughs> this like, this why, is, why is that this the approach of a regulator? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure is the honest truth. <laughs> I don't okay. know. I have asked him this. He, he would, of course, completely reject my characterization. He would say, I've done nothing of the sort. I've been very clear. The law is very clear. Everybody can read the law. Everybody should know that their projects are all securities. It's obvious. And I don't know what you're complaining about. That's, <laughs> that, that's basically some version of that is what he would say. I just completely disagree. Do you think that there will be some fallout uh, from the, FT the recent events of, of FTX that will come back to regulators like the SEC? Is it the question of why didn't you do more, this sort of thing? Um, do you think that that's fair? Do you think the SEC or CFTC could have done more in this situation? Or what's your explanation of uh, who, who is at fault, I guess, in this particular situation? So uh, there's, there's a technical uh, question and then there's a more um, uh, a broader question, right? The technical question to my mind is to what extent do they actually have jurisdiction over a foreign entity that's operating out of a different you know, political entity, right? Obviously, the SEC does not have jurisdiction over the Bahamas. Um, but to the extent that Americans are investing or are involved, does that give them some jurisdiction? That There's some legal questions I don't really know the answer to, but uh, th these are well known, so we'll get answers to that. The bigger question, though, the bigger fallout should be that, hey, the lack of clarity probably contributed to this whole mess. Because if we had provided clarity and we had provided clear rules and they applied to everyone, then the Coinbases of the world, the, the other exchanges that, that all they want to do is be in compliance so that they can compete on a level playing field, that's, that's where business would gravitate to. And you wouldn't be able to successfully operate this outpost on the Bahamas where no one would know what you're doing if, the, if their competitors had the uh, certainty of this regulatory regime. So I would argue that what the SEC has done probably contributed to the growth of FTX. And that ought to, that's something that ought to, they ought to feel some heat for that. Yeah, I think I can speak for the entire crypto industry, which we definitely feel that that was the case. Uh, that's, that's from users who lost funds in FTX to builders like Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, all feel very, very frustrated that the SEC created the paradigm that allowed for FTX to, totally. to get so incredibly big. Uh, Senator Toomey, what, what do you hope Congress does as a result of this? Um, one, one thing I've learned while talking to so many legislators and regulators out there is that everyone is saying that the solution for this mess is legislation, 
on Capitol Hill. Um, so if, if you had a message to all of your fellow congressmen and senators, uh, what would you say? Yeah, I would. I've been saying this for a long time and it, we're late to the game, but it's not too late. Let's let's pass legislation. My suggestion would be let's try not to do a whole comprehensive all things crypto all at once omnibus bill. That's probably not going to work, but we don't have to do that either. We could do little bits. So I've got a bill right now with a Democratic co-sponsor that would fix the problem with the broker definition so that we wouldn't be technically obligating validators to come up with information about individuals behind transactions when obviously they don't have that information, right? So let I, we can fix that. I think we actually have a pretty good shot at fixing that before this year is over. I've got a bill with Kirsten Cinema, which would allow for small transactions to be paid for with crypto that is sold and for which there wouldn't be a capital gain. So we would alleviate the huge you know, uh, compliance burden of tracking all of that. But really, what I think we really need to do, let's, let's start with stable coins, right? Stable coins are a discrete category. They're relatively easy to understand. I've got a framework out there that's very similar to the framework that Cynthia Lummis and Kirsten Gillibrand came up with. If we could get something done on stable coins, that would be like this huge step forward. I think it would be extremely encouraging. It, it wouldn't by itself solve all the problems. We still have the issue of how you how you decide what's a security and what's a not what's not a security. But if we could if we could resolve the question of who can issue stable coins, under what conditions, how is it regulated, I think that would be very, very constructive. It'd be a great first step. And then, hey, after that, we, we, you know, we take on the next challenge. How close do you think we are to doing something like that? Um, I, I'm hoping that I'm quite close to announcing a bipartisan stablecoin bill. Um, getting it across the goal line this year will still be very difficult. I'm not going not gonna to kid you. Uh, I, I think we could get to a, uh, you know, a introducing a bill that has a bipartisan list of co-sponsors. And that's a huge step in the right direction, right? The House was trying to negotiate something between Maxine Waters and Patrick McHenry, the chair and ranking member, respectively, on uh, our counterpart committee in the House. They never were really were able to quite get there. If we could get a bipartisan product that dealt with this, it put a lot of pressure on the administration to come to the table and, and get this resolved. And the administration, I will say, in fairness, the, some in the administration understand that we really should do this. We really need to get it done. The question is, can we get them to a place where they'll do it in a fashion that allows this space to thrive as opposed to be stifled? I think that's very important, and that's kind of key, right? Is um, you know, which is a reason I think we like stablecoin regulation as a starting point is because at least when you're talking about the centralized stablecoins like um, the you know, stablecoin USDC from from Coinbase and Circle, right? These are very kind of known quantities. These are centralized products. In order to do that in a way that doesn't stifle innovation of some of the things that we're building in DeFi, um, we interestingly enough. It, it was revealed that um, yeah, SBF was uh, that same Bankman Freed behind FTX was very involved in some of the legislation be, be behind uh, the proposed legislation of the DCCPA. And some of that felt to so the crypto industry, the crypto community, like there was sort of a, a pulling up the ladder, an entrenchment mm. of regulatory capture, entrenchment of larger in institutions. Now FTX had become an institution, these banks, uh, and kind of a, uh, you know, a push against DeFi, so making certain things in decentralized finance um, illegal, making all front ends of decentralized finance um, have to register as a as a broker dealer as something, uh, and so we're very worried about about I guess Congress passing legislation on topics that are still emerging and not understood. Stablecoins is not one of them necessarily, but it also could be if it's done in a sloppy way. How can we prevent the sloppiness? Uh, look, the, there's always a danger of that, but I think the danger is greater if we do nothing, right? Because if we do nothing, then I expect the administration to act. And then you'll have regulators simply declaring that they have the authority. They'll find a lawyer who can make the argument. And that might be extremely hostile to the space. Um, look, I have a lot of respect for the governors of the Federal Reserve, for instance. 
However, I'm also of the view that it is like fundamental to the DNA of a central banker to be very hostile to anything that faintly resembles privately issued money. So I don't want them regulating this space because I don't think it's <laughs> you really want treasury. Be, uh, Do this. Well, and then treasury. There's there's a whole set of reasons, but but still, there's going to have to be. Uh, so, for instance, if you advertise yourself as having an asset-backed stable coin, and you're you're claiming that it is backed with fiat assets, then it really ought to be backed by those assets, right? And so a disclosure requirement where it can be proven that you do in fact have the cash and cash equivalents that you claim you have, that is a reasonable thing for someone who claims to have an asset-backed stable coin. But I've got some colleagues who think we should just have an outright ban on algorithmic stable coins. Well, I, I for one, am actually skeptical about whether you can develop a workable algorithmic stable coin but what do I know, right? Somebody might very well figure out how to do that. So I wouldn't presume to ban it. That's a terrible idea. A disclosure, you know, making sure that somebody who's offering a stable coin that is not backed by any uh, fiat assets, that, that ought to be very clear so that investors know what they're getting into. But I, I don't want to be shutting down whole potential categories. Honestly, this whole conversation, uh, Senator Toomey, makes me uh, optimistic, actually. I didn't expect uh, all of this coming in, but um, I think many in crypto take kind of a skeptical lens to uh, the legislative process and, and Capitol Hill. But talking to you, uh, it, it's pretty optimistic. Um, and honestly, I mean, this is what the legislative uh, you know, assemblies in, in, in D.C. are supposed to do. They're supposed to represent the people. And crypto, after all, is a technology by the people and for the people, right? It is a technology that I think that the framers of the Constitution would uh, very much support. Um, I guess my last question for you as, as we close here, Senator, is um, how can crypto people who are maybe jaded by the politics of, of things, things they see in Washington, how can they make their voice heard? How can they get involved in the process? Many of them feel sort of powerless, but what can they do to support efforts uh, towards good legislation in D.C. to make sure that we don't miss out on this? So I would say that there is a very significant number of members of the House, members of the Senate, who don't know a lot about this space, don't actually have a well-defined set of views, but they're open-minded. They need an education. And it, it's much better if people who actually know what they're doing because they're active in this space provide that education rather than if it all comes from whatever they read on the front page of the daily paper, which of course is going to be the FTX blow up. So don't underestimate your ability to have an influence, especially with something as new new to members of Congress as this space is. Reach out, sit down with the staff that handles this. Most of them will take a meeting with you if you're a constituent. So look up your member of Congress and go, go have a meeting. You'll, you'll meet with their staff most likely, but you may find that the staff is actually pretty well informed. You may find that they don't know anything about it, but engage, right? And if you are seen as a knowledgeable person who is trusted to be a straight shooter, um, you'd be surprised how quickly um, people will, will start to seek your, your input. That, that's what happens in this space. So engage, engage with your members of Congress. Good thought to end with. Engage in the political process as well as we are um, evaluating crypto too. Senator Toomey, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you coming on Bankless. All right. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. Keep fighting. All right. Will do.